out of all things, what made you want to be a software engineer? Um, be, to, to be honest with you, because I looked at the, the salaries, I've always been a techie. I've always been a geek. I've always been a nerd. Um, so I've always been into, like, you know, science fiction. I've always been to anime. I've been into the video games, hardcore, superheroes, comics, all that. So I heard you say one of the magic words. You said boot camp. Yeah, so the boot camp I went to, it's called the Prenti. So I went for the, obviously, the software engineering path. So, and basically what they do, they put you in a boot camp for four months, three months, depending on the track you're going. The beauty of the program, I think this is the, the, the number one reason why I went to the program, because they guarantee you a job after the training's done, right? So you go from the boot camp, and then you go to on the job training after the boot camp for at least a year. So when I was done with the boot camp, um, I immediately had a job. I already knew who I was going to be working for. This video is being brought to you by Leveled Up in Tech. Even if you have no experience in cloud and computing, Level Up in Tech is here to help you get into the cloud. Now you may be asking yourself, why should I get in the cloud? Well, let me show you. So, a cloud computing engineer can make anywhere from $80,000 to $200,000 per year. Now, cloud computing will create almost a million new job demand for certain skills. One recent study predicted that there will be over 220,000 open cloud computing positions by 2025. Level Up in Tech has a six step process to guarantee your success. Here are some reasons why you should choose Level Up in Tech. And here are some of the things you will learn. You'll learn about server config and troubleshooting, the AWS cloud, infrastructure as code, scripting, containerization, and much, much more. You can check out many of their testimonials on their website and they post testimonials on LinkedIn as well. Here's where some of the former students of Level Up Tech work at and articles you can see them in and hear their coaches. If you're ready to get your cloud career started, click the link in my bio to learn more about Level Up Tech. All right, welcome back to the Textual Talk Podcast. Well, I'm your host, HD. It's episode 118. <laughs> and we have with us today, guys, Twitter's favorite tech. I'm going to call him tech troll because I can tell when he's trolling, but others can't because they just <laughs> don't want to like him. But we got Mr. Clive Freeman in the building, everybody. So if you have him right now, give us a round of applause for making this happen. We've been trying to do this since he went viral. And um, I'm really mad, though, because he went viral, but them people didn't follow him. Like, that's weird. Wow. <laughs> but uh, he rocking with us here today on on a Saturday. If y'all was listening to Patreon, we didn't have some, like, in-depth discussions that actually could have been the whole pod, but I had to reel it back in. We can mm -hmm. we can do our Cat Williams stuff just yet. We're going to let them we gonna let them unravel. But, man, Clyde, how's, how's it going today? Man, doing good. You know, I can't, can't complain. Just, you know, living life. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Doing what I normally do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, uh, before I, I mess with you and you introduce yourself to the audience, man, let me tell the audience too, I don't know if I just said it, but remember, subscribe, thumbs up, hit all and everything. If you're listening right now, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you know what to do, leave a review, share it out, follow the podcast. But real quick, could you introduce yourself to the, the audience and kind of let them know what your background is right now? Yeah, sure. So, obviously, you introduced me before. My name is Clyde Freeman. Um, so, you know, I don't have a traditional tech background. So, I started my career um, in finance. I went to school for finance, business admin. Was kind of doing that for about, you know, about seven, seven, eight years, working at various financial firms, doing um, financial planning and forecasting at various um, companies, um, both private equity. I worked in private equity. Um, utility companies and my last company before I left was actually a, fi a financial um, services firm. Um, it was there that I actually caught the coding bug, if you will, because, you know, I was a spreadsheet jockey, Excel, uh, Excel sh sheet jockey and kind of like, let me automate my workflow. So that's when I kind of got into using Excel macros. I got into kind of automating um, the data and migrating the data to a PowerPoint spreadsheet. And then, you know, doing all this kind of gave me a lot of free time to think about what I wanted to do since a lot of the workload, a lot of the tedious work was kind of automated. And I kind of found myself liking the technical piece of financial analysis. So I was like, maybe I try my hand at doing this full time, like my full time job. So that's when I kind of like started, you know, on going on, on YouTube, um, going on Google, just researching how to break into tech. Because at this time, this is when tech is starting to bubble up. It's starting to get to, to, to the place where people think they can get into it. Obviously, people know that there's a big money in there. So I'm like... I can I can do this. I kind of always been technical my entire life, and I decided to make that leap. and And I, I say it's a leap because I was making great money. I had a great job, um, great company, great benefits, and I was like, if I don't do it now at this time, 
I think I was around um, 28, 29. Um, and I was telling my friends, I was telling my family about it. They were like, you sure about this? And I was like, yeah, because I know if I stay here any longer, I get a promotion, I'm going to have golden handcuffs, and I'm not going to want to make that leap. And, you know, so from there, you know, I joined the coding boot camp, and the rest of this history, I've been doing this or ever since. So it's been it's been great. Um, and uh, I, I'm really glad I took, you know, that leap of faith and, and really invested in myself because if I didn't, I'll probably, be, you know, I think I'll still be living a good life, but I definitely wouldn't be as happy as I am now. Appreciate that, man. I didn't even know you had a finance background. Mm -hmm. You care to name that finance company? I work for, for Fidelity. Okay. Investment. Hey, Fidelity is a good company. It is. They, that's what I say. Because even if, like, for example, for I'm in cybersecurity, specifically the blue team, they pay them well mm. and good bonuses and stuff, too. It's a great company. Uh, trust me, I, I didn't leave because, you know, I would have stayed, to be honest with you. The, the bonus was great. Um, the company culture, my team was great. Um and they operated more like a tech company. People don't know yeah, that they they do. We had a, we have a thing called they had a, they had a thing at least um, called Fidelity Labs where they were experimenting with a whole bunch of you know this automated technology, AI. They had like this little small startup incubator within the company. So they were doing some great stuff. Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't know is in finance, a lot of those finance companies are snatching up the software engineers and everybody else, data, uh, what machine learning, AI, data scientists, data analytics. They're getting more technical. I think, what was that? Was that J.P. Morgan Chase? I, I used to work at Chase, but I think mm. I saw an article was saying they had more engineers than, like, some of the fame companies. Mm. And I, I believe them because Chase is pretty huge. Yeah, because um, if you haven't noticed by now, like, a lot of the companies are realizing that the machine can do what these stock brokers, these, these stock traders can do in a, in a fraction of a second um, all day without getting tired. And they can make more decisions and obviously based off empirical data rather than emotion. So with the machine, it's all logic, right? So there's benefits to that. So that they're realizing that and then obviously the speed and the efficiency of the game with that is you can't go back. So right. they're leveraging that early. You know, I know AI is big now, but these companies have been doing this for yeah, way wow. before that while now. So you all the way from what what is the nickname for Boston? Like what do black people call Boston? I don't know why we call Boston. What we, what we call the Bean. People call it Bean Town, the Bean. <laughs> I usually call it. I don't even call it the Bean Town. The bean Town. I, I'm. I call it Boston, right? I'm finna, uh, I'm finna crack a corny dad joke. Like, do you like Boston baked beans? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't think I really even eat them like that. I like Boston uh, baked beans. People say it all the time, like, like they, they're, they're good. I've, I've had them, but it's not like, oh yeah, that's like a. Yeah, I think back being back in Boston is more like seafood, right? So you get the New England clam chowder, the lobster. Y'all real big right? on what Old Bay and stuff like that, using Old Bay. Was that a Baltimore thing? I think it's a Baltimore thing. I'm not a I'm not a cook, so I, I'm bad on that. But um, no, I think that's a Baltimore thing. I think it's more so so seafood. Where is Where's your Boston accent? <sighs> we don't have Boston accents. I, I, by the way, let me give you some background. I'm from Boston, but I'm particularly uh, from a neighborhood called Roxbury, right? So Roxbury is like ain't that where uh, mm -hmm. New Edition them from? Yeah. So it's a black neighborhood, right? So that's why people say, "Are you from Boston?" I didn't know. I didn't know black people lived in Boston. I'm like. My whole life, I'm like, all I grew up around is black people. So yeah. um, it's a black neighborhood. But I will say this. Um, a lot of, you know, people who say that because, you know, you know, you think of Boston, you think of like, you know, what's his name? Ben Affleck. You think of the dude from the Born Supremacy. What's his name? Matt, Matt, Ack? Matt Damon. Matt Damon. You think of that. You think the Wahlbergs, right? They don't really show rock spray. So when people say, oh, oh, black people? Because they don't see that. Yeah. Like, that part of, of, of Boston. Right. But it, it, it's there, like. Uh, Boston's one of the, the few minority majority cities in, in the nation. People don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing is, so mm -hmm. a show I used to watch was called uh, Survivor's Remorse. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to be a family from Boston. It was Tashina Arnold. Oh. Um, whatever my guy was that, do you watch The Boys on Prime? Oh, yeah. That's the dude show. that's the, the fast dude. So Jesse, uh, oh, Jesse T. Is. Usher or something, whatever his name yeah, is. Yeah, I know you're talking about. Him. A-Train, right? Yeah. A-Train, the dude who played... Uh, he played, what's my boy's name? He played a lot of stuff, but like most people probably remember him from playing one of the sister's boyfriends on uh, Sister Sister. Not the dark skinned dude, the other one. I can't think of his real name. Mm. But him and the other chick, but her name was like MCAT on the show. But anyway, 
they're they're supposed to be based out of Boston. And they try to make them have like talk like they're from Boston. The only reason I say that though, because the first two years of my yeah. tech career, yeah, I worked helped us for TSA. So I've talked to people at the Boston airports yeah, before. Logan. Yeah. So I was able to know, okay, you from Boston. Oh, this yeah. person. Cause it's like it's similar to people that's in New York. Really? But it's yeah, but it's a little bit different. Like when I were like talking to somebody at Logan or then if somebody coming in from LaGuardia, I could tell it's very subtle, but I can tell the difference. It's, it's, it's funny because people say that people, I went to HBCU for the first two years of college. I went to Hampton and everyone was like, oh, yeah, you got a Boston accent. And I'm like, I do. Um, Cause let's say I, I say, I say Boston. Like, I feel like, I feel like, like everyone else says it. I think that comes with, I'm going to say this because no one I know has a Boston accent that I know that lives in Boston. The people who have Boston accent are white people who live, in certain areas, right? So, especially if you have like an Irish background. Yeah. So, if you live like in South Boston, they call it Southie. Yeah. Or, or you live in like uh, West Roxbury, like uh, or, or some parts of Cambridge. If you have like one of my ex girlfriends, is like she she was Irish, and she, her family's from Southie, but she lived in Cambridge. Cambridge is like where Harvard is, like right across the bridge from Boston. It's, it's okay. A city called Cambridge, where actually Harvard is. Um, and she had the accent. She's like, Ka, you know, she's saying, I'm from Boston, you know, like, yeah, she yeah, had that. that accent to the T. Yeah. And that, those people will have it really. But if you're black, usually, or you're a minority, yeah. Not, not really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. So, briefly, so I would say, so you got into like want to move, pivot into tech around what, 2018, 2019? Yeah, I'll say um, officially 2019. Okay. I was doing it in my first professional career was in 2019, but I wasn't doing it since two, 2018. Okay. And so I heard you say one of the magic words. You said boot camp. So, well, actually, I want to ask you this, though, first, yeah. right? And this is why I want to ask you this, because you're a person that I would presume, because we talked before this, that you were making really good money already in finance. Mm-hmm. I have people sometimes where they're making good money in their career, but they want to pivot in cybersecurity or something like that. However, sometimes the jump isn't what they're looking for. And as far as they are increasing salary or yeah, it's like similar sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're not willing to say, well, I'm not, you know, want to finna do nothing laterally and move, you know, lose some of my benefits that I have and that, which I understand because sometimes there are extenuating circumstances. You can't, really much like make a move for it. But however, well, most people sometimes aren't getting the same salary. Yeah. But then some people may be making more, but realize they may have to take two steps back to go, they get three steps forward eventually. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's what I always say. People think that, you know, career progression is always linear, right? It's always a linear um, arrow straight up, right? That That's not the, the case. And uh, I'll do a brief story about my, in finance, when I was in finance, right, so I was working at a utility company before I went to Fidelity. Uh, and, and, again, crazy company. My mother worked there. She was a director, so I had a little bit of clout there. You know, it was comfortable, but I wasn't happy at all. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to go to Fidelity or any financial services company because I feel like it could challenge me more. So when I got Fidelity, it was actually a pay decrease of about 5000 We salary transparent here, right? <laughs> so so I, I don't care about my salary. I'll, I'll tell you what I make. Um, so it was about a 5K um, decrease. That's not that bad. And the, but the bonus was better. So all in all, it was more money in the short term because I, was, I got a sign-on bonus when I came, and oh, yeah. the bonus was generally better. But it was initially a, a pay decrease. Um, I decided to go with it because I know that it was going to set me up in the future, right? So that's the same way I would suggest people look at if you want to transition into tech. It's going to be a short term. It may not. This is not even the case 100% of the time, but it may be a short term back. You know, you, you might you might have to see yourself downgrading or taking a step backwards in your career as far as your salary expectations go. But you have to see that forward vision. You have to say, like, OK, I did my research. So I knew long term that being in tech and being in the role I want to be over the long term, I would be making more money than if I went to tr- traditional financial route that I was currently taking. So when I was at Fidelity, I did the research. My case was a little bit different because I actually w- would be making more money when I, when I transitioned to tech, right? But in the short term, and we can probably get into this a little bit later too about the exact boot camp I went to. Yeah, but I was going to ask you that eventually. Yeah, so the boot camp I went to was a, is a, is a beautiful program. So I'm going to shout this program out. It's called the Prenti. 
Um, and it's nat- it's a national program. Basically, what they do, they you know, um, a lot of you know, labor unions are people who work in like plumbing, electrical. They have unions, and the way they kind of like onboard their employees is they do an apprenticeship program. So you work under a journeyman, and you pretty much learn underneath them until you're ready to take that position as well. So what they do is they apply that kind of same model to the tech industry. So I went for the obviously the software engineering path. So part of that was obviously I had to quit my job. So that meant that I would be out of out of work for, I think the boot camp they, they put you in is four months. So I, I would be legit unemployed for four months. The thing that I lucked out with is that the company that was sponsoring me was a company that was generous. So I got a stipend. So during the boot camp, I got a $2,000 stipend. So it alleviated the bloke. At this time, I had a condo, you know, so I had to support myself at a car, blah, blah, blah. So that helped a lot. Um, but most people don't have that kind of background. Some people don't have that stipend. So what I would suggest in, in, in that case would be for people to kind of like brace for it and just know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, that's that's all I can say. I know a lot of people wouldn't have made that, that sacrifice. But, you know, it worked out for me in the end. But back to Apprenti. Um, so basically they're a national program that, like I said before, they kind of like use that apprenticeship model for tech. And basically what they do, they put you in a boot camp for four months, three months, depending on the track you're going. They have multiple tracks for cybersecurity. I think they have like UX design now, software engineering. You can go on the website. Um, they'll tell you. And basically what they do is the beauty of the program. I think this is the, the, the number one reason why I went to the program because they guarantee you a job after the training's done, right? So you go from the boot camp and then you go to on-the-job training after the boot camp for at least a year. So when I was done with the boot camp, um, I immediately had a job. I already knew who I was going to be working for, um, and that was the beauty of it. So I had the job for a year. Um, we can get into, you know, the actual job later on, but um, yeah, after the year, I was let go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, you know, that started my unemployed my, or my fun employment journey. And actually, it was a blessing in disguise because I was actually able to connect with some people that I met from the job. And we started a new company and, and you know. We can get that later. We can get that later. Okay. That's, that's a lot. First of all, you said it's called Printy? Apprenti, yeah. Apprenti. I'm going to cut this section of the video up, send it to y'all. That way, if y'all want a sponsorship, we put it right here so y'all can go ahead and uh, send me some of them ad dollars that y'all guarantee people jobs with. But what made you, and this is kind of funny because I'm, I'm laughing in my head actually this kind of stuff, though. <laughs> Out of all things, what made you want to be a software engineer? Um. Be, to, to be honest with you, because I looked at the the salary, so 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 money was a, a big one. Uh, I was like, hey, I can make some big money doing this, right? You know what I'm saying? For the lifestyle I wanted, obviously, you know, I grew up wanting a nice house, I wanted a nice car, so I knew that becoming a software engineer, the salary expectations were there for me, um, and I always been a techie, I always been a geek, I always been a nerd, um, so I've always been into like you know. Science fiction, I've been to anime, I've been into the video games, hardcore, superheroes, comics, all that. So kind of like, I, it was kind of in my realm to be kind of techie and, and hands-on with gadgets, period. And I felt that, you know, just being a software engineer, you know, put me in the forefront, put me right in the weeds of, of technology. And like I said before, when I was working on Fidelity, I, I found myself that I, had, I actually had a technical expertise and an aptitude for it as well. So those three factors basically put me in. Okay. Did you ever think about trying to to be a software engineer for Fidelity? Um, yeah, I did, actually. Um, I actually visited. I actually talked to some of the engineers there. Um, the only thing that made me hesitant about it was that I knew that there was, like, some, you know, I, I felt like the transitional process would have been longer mm-hmm. instead of me just leaving, right? Right. So when I left, I could just be one instead of, you know, going through the, the red tape the and then transferring and getting permission from managers and then doing training. With a printer, I would have guarantees, so. though. I was like, I got it. I'm, I'm just gonna leave. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Now, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you told that story though, because we talk about investing in yourself and money, and we have people all the time. Like, quick story: if you follow me on LinkedIn, uh, you're watching this video right now, so you already know it's, it's sponsored by Level Up and Tech. Shout out to my guys over there. Mm-hmm. They have like the most testimonials that they post for getting people uh, into tech, especially they deal with getting people in cloud computing. Hmm. And I post a pretty much an advertising form on my LinkedIn, and I have two negative Nancys on there <laughs> who don't Always. normally they don't normally interact with me. So I did. I think I made a story the other day on my Instagram and told people like, "Hey, 
keep it cute on LinkedIn. <laughs> just keep it cute. Because they have some type of thing that I guess they got with the actual program. And they just felt the need that they had to come on there and say dumb stuff like, oh, what's the price? And do you get VA tuition and all that other stuff? Like, mm. bro, like, if they do or they don't, why do you care? Mm. Like, all this different things. Like, I tell everybody, say it's more than one way to skin a cat. Everybody can't get in for free. Some mm. people need a strict curriculum and some they need to invest in to keep them accountable to get to that goal. I agree. Because it was somebody the other day, uh, I think it's the guy, uh, Kenyon, he was talking about how all the people who booked his free spots for consults didn't show up. And I was like, that's the reason I've always charged. You're going to respect what you pay for. Yes. Totally agree with that. Because when it's free, there's a there's an expectation. There's, there's like a evaluation on it, right? Right. If it's free, people don't value it as much. Because if it's free, it can't be too valuable. But if you put a price on it, people, unfortunately, they they assign a higher value to it. Because oh, I had to pay for it, so I'm going to go to this guy. I can get, get my money's worth. Right. That's just what it is. It sucks, but that's what it is. Right. Yeah, and, and then, like, in this case, this same person, uh, well, I, we got acquainted with each other because one time they were saying something about, I don't know, whatever, somebody was charging for a resume or something, but I was just under the assumption, like, hey, whatever the price is, it don't matter because if they pay that thousand fifteen hundred dollars whatever they paying for the resume, but it gets them a job that they get, like, a, you know, $20,000, $50,000, $30,000 increase, they got their return on investment back. And so everybody's just always trying to tell somebody what they shouldn't charge or this is too much. And then they want to say, oh, well, I'm going to do it for free. And the same person tried to do it for free. And it's like, I wasn't prepared to take all these costs, so I'm shutting down the costs for now. Like, exactly. Like, everybody always trying to, like, be a superhero and then realize, like, you're going to burn yourself out. You're giving. You're taking too much time for yourself. This same person, too, gets on my nerves because I don't like people like this. They will always try to flex how long they mean. Oh, I've been – uh, Cause I think he does software engineering for like the NBA or something. I don't care. I hope mm-hmm. he, hopefully he listening. <laughs> I've been here 25 years and doing this. And I'll be like, bro, don't yeah. nobody care how long you've been in the game. What they got to do with me? I've been in 10. Like you can't just, I don't care how long you've been there. Everybody got how long they've been in there. That's not like, mm-hmm. okay. So this, like, I don't need this. I, this, I do know for a fact, this can help people. That's the reason why I'm advertising it. If you don't, you know, if you don't think you can help people go on, there are people who make more absurd claims and I don't go on their posts. And comment on it because I'm like, that's their post. If I got something to say, I'll bring it here or whatever. But I was just like, I don't like that. I've dealt with that on TikTok before. People just acting like, oh, well, people reported to, I used to run socks and all this other stuff. I'm like, so what's that have to do with anything that I'm saying? How's that negate what I'm saying to you? Like, like, stop. Like, you come off as a cornball. That's what happens uh, when you're in social. Trust me, I learned. <laughs> I learned my lesson. Yeah, we're going to talk about way. it. <laughs> we're going to talk about it. So initially you would say your journey from, so what was your like actual title again uh, in finance? In finance, I was, uh, I think it was FA, I think it was F, FA3. So that's a final financial analyst three. So, but I worked in FRAC, right? So I worked in Fidelity Real Estate Corporation. It was like a side company, Fidelity. Okay. So I managed uh, real estate portfolios across the, the U.S. Okay. So you would say you went from financial analyst to software engineering about what, like 15 months? So. Because I know you it said four months for the boot camp, then like a year for the apprenticeship. Yeah, but I was doing it before that. Like I had to join the boot camp prior to that as well. So. Oh, so you did a. Okay. So <laughs> printy was an, um, what's the second thing you did? Printy was the second thing I did. Okay. And, and, and I just happened, it gave you the job. I really, personally, I didn't need to go to the boot camp because I, I was kind of doing it on the side anyway. I was co- coding on the side. I had went to a boot camp previously, like legit. So which 17. one you went to? I did, I did both. I did both. No, no, which boot camp? I went to a boot camp. It's a local boot camp in Boston called codesquad.org. Okay. There, called Code Squad. So I did that. So I kind of did that, and then I was self-teaching myself the whole time. So when I got into Apprentice, it was like, okay, because apprentice was mainly for people fresh, no coding experience. I just happened to have the coding experience. So when I did go to the boot camp, I kind of like went through the boot camp just, just, just for the heck of it. But I had kind of already knew my stuff. So that what made me like kind of like taught my class at the point because I, I did it already. I've been doing it for like that point, maybe a year by myself. And I was like basically self taught at that point. But okay. It just reinforced some of the concept, so that's why. Okay, cool. No, I was just saying, like, you just got on YouTube University one day and said, oh, cool, I'm going to do these projects, and I'm going to... That's what it takes. Like, I, I remember going on Craigslist. I got a, a MacBook, uh, a, a desktop Mac, and I just started doing HTML, basically, HTML, CSS, um, 
just that. <laughs> just HTML, CSS, you're doing basic form, having a title on the screen, doing a heart reload, um, practicing with the form fields, and, you know, doing basic stuff. Like, the first thing I did was ugly. It was yeah. turning turn to feel red or something like that. So that's all. I didn't even get into JavaScript until later. I was just like, okay, this is cool. I never tell my girlfriend, like, look what I did. Look what this, this, this form field I built. You know what I'm saying? It was simple, looking back onto it, but um, that's how I started. And, and, and from there, I just obviously progressed. I kept, I kept at it. And for me, like, I always say like I'm, I'm equivalent to like Goku from anime, like from Dragon Ball. Like I always want to improve, so like doing that wasn't enough for me. Cause Man, you know all you have to do is just start yelling. <laughs> yeah, power enough. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's basically what I was doing though. But in the tech field, I was like, okay, this is nice, but I always want to get better. Right. Cause obviously, I was seeing, you know, what other people were doing online. I was seeing these crazy stories about, oh, I learned to code. Now I got a yacht. Now, like you know, something. Like, mm-hmm. Okay, I need to get on that level right now. So that that would pushed me to keep on doing it even on the weekends you know it helped that i was broke at this time because i was like house i was house poor for my condo so you know i was staying in the house and, and this code and okay and just research stuff online so so did you do you see the meme sometimes like uh like uh, you're a programmer now you you program hello world and now you say about you a program yep yep <laughs> that, that was me that was hey. that was legit me <laughs> i was like word i can see it on the screen that's that's what's up <laughs> uh, yeah i made a little calculator okay cool the calculator so app, yep. I want to switch it into this uh, this thing real quick. So now you are a you are senior. I'm an SC three, um, and I don't want you to say where, and mm-hmm. I don't want you to say where only because to protect you. Yeah, and so I don't waste my money and have to take this down or something because that's happened to me in the past. People. Mm-hmm. Have, Said where they work, and then somebody like, "Hey, uh, you said this. We don't like it. You got to take it down." Yeah, and even though technically. I don't have to because I don't work for him. I don't want nothing to happen to you at work just because I don't want to take something down. So, yeah. So let, let's say let's say at mid level, depending on I, 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 the company. Yeah, yeah. Because that's a that's funny enough that you said that. That might be a topic or a solo episode one day. My friends and I we were all talking it was like how you could be senior in one place, but that's not senior somewhere else. Yeah. Or like you may be principal somewhere, but that's not staff somewhere else. Exactly. So it, the levels get kind of kind of wonky when you, you can go to, from company to company. So let's say at mid-level. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, your title is senior, though. No, it's SE3. Oh, okay. Got it, got it. <laughs> let's, but, I mean, I want you to talk about kind of what you do now. I guess, okay, let's briefly talk about, let's go back. Let's talk about that company that y'all started, and then I guess that should lead to what you do now, right? Yeah. Or whenever yeah. you move to Dallas. Yeah, so I moved to Dallas because I was laid off um, uh, at the previous company I worked at. Um, so I, I kind of always wanted to go to to, to to Texas, but I was like, look, 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 this is the perfect time. I'm, I'm fun employed, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I have, what's that? What's that term mean? Fun employed. Um, basically, I'm having fun because if you notice, the brokers people have the most fun. <laughs> so they. they I did have a lot most. of fun when I was laid off. Exactly right. So I, shouldn't yeah. have been having fun. Should have been in the house uh, doing Uber or something. Yeah, so, so, trust me. Like I see people, they may not be fun employed, but they're like they're broke and they live the best life. They traveling to Dubai right now. So um, they scamming. I was like, okay, look, I'm fun employed right now. You know, this is a perfect time for me to kind of like do what I want to do. I'm not, I'm not kind of bounded by the, the golden handcuffs that I had had. And I always wanted to go to Houston. A lot of my friends lived in Houston at the time. I visited plenty of times. I had a good time, but then I was like, okay, I want to get a job. I want to be in tech. Um, Houston's maybe, you know, I had a girlfriend. So I'm like, maybe that's not the right place for us to be at the time. So then we decided to go to Austin. So Austin's a tech hub. Right in Atlanta. <laughs> right. We I visited it the year before in 2019 for 4th of July. I had a blast. I'm like, okay, I can live here. Boom. We pack up. I rent out my condo. And then we drive, take the 30-hour drive down to, to Austin into our apartment unseen. Right. So we start doing that and I'm starting to apply. Boom, boom, boom. Now, at first, you know, you know, I'm, I'm applying in the, 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 pl- the application process was crazy because, you know, I was getting re- rejections on, the, on a regular basis. It was really you know, at first I was like, whatever, I'm, I'm getting unemployment. I got the STEMI check. I'm actually getting paid more money than I did when I was working. So I wasn't stressing. I was going on the lake every day. I was living <laughs> life. But towards the end of the six months, I was like, okay, I haven't got a job yet. Like, what, what, what's going on? I'm supposed to be in a tech hub. You know, I work for a reputable company. My resume, I got one year of experience at least. Like, you know, I'm, I'm good to talk to. I can I can speak. I can sell myself in interviews. What the hell's going on here? Um, and then and at that point, um, one of my product managers from – from the last company I worked for, you know, we, we can call it the purple company. Um, I worked 
he reached out to me and said, hey, I got a new venture um, with this this startup that me and this other guy are trying to do right now. We would love to have you kind of help us, you know, build the, the V1 of the app. And I was like, perfect, because this is a way for me to kind of like fill in that um, that gap that yeah. would be in my resume. I'm actually doing actual development work and it would help me because at the time I only had a year, one year experience. And, you know, working with a guy that I enjoy working with, you know, yeah. another black guy um, who, who does excellent work, um, Calvin. Um, so I was like, perfect. Met the, the other co-founder, Martel, and then we, we got to work. So we got to work. We built the V1. How much they uh, paid you? Because I know you had to get no paid. Money. No money. So it was like all back in. All back in inequity. So I didn't get paid anything. I was just doing this off the strength of, you know, believing in the vision and the company. I obviously had the equity. Mm-hmm. And then eventually... I built that up, and then eventually, you know, we had a CTO at the time, but then he had another venture, so then he kind of went to do that full-time, and then I kind of got, like, you know, moved up to um, to acting CTO and where I was, like, managing operations. And at that time, we had, you know, obviously secured some funding. Um, we actually got into a program called Techstars, which was like, the number two accelerator in the country, so we got some additional funds, and then we were able to kind of, hire a team we had an offshore development team of about six engineers we had two front end one android one ios one um web developer and a couple back end guys and we had a pm all right so i my, my day-to-day became managing those guys um so okay. that's how we got into that so so, so you was in tech <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's so that so that's what that was what was that so I, we but by, by the way the name of the company is called soco or what's called soco and then basically we the aim was to kind of like democratize the referral process. So right now we, we kind of noticed that the the referral process is kind of monopolized. Referrals as into what? Employee referrals. Like okay. any company. Right, right now, I think most companies have a, a, an employee referral program where you get like a kickback. You may get $5,000 if the person's successfully hired. And what we found out is that most people get hired by referrals because yeah. – about seventy percent of jobs like come from like your network, and then some that don't even get posted. Your network, right? So, so they post it just because they got to, but the person who's supposed to already be there is going to work there. Exactly right. So we was like, why? Why just keep this in companies? Why would we not, just not open source it? Basically, like so anyone could um, refer someone for a company. So our, the, the theory was that companies would post on our platform, and that people who are on our platform as well can refer people that they knew for the job. So it's basically an externalized referral program. For everybody, and the premise was that a software engineer would be a better um, would be a better vetter of another software engineer. Right. We noticed that a lot of HR recruiters, and I don't want to hate on the recruiters, but sometimes they don't know enough to accurately vet somebody. I think that's most. I think mm-hmm. that's most re- recruiters. I mean, they got some of them got the keywords they go through, but I mm-hmm. think it's most because you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So I had a recruiter say um, they didn't know what Swift was, and they were recruiting for an iOS position. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's things like that where they're obviously they're on the sheet, and you say your spill. You know they give you you give your elevator pitch, and they're like, okay, I heard Swift check. I heard it was that Xcode. Okay, check. And he said um, variables and properties. Okay, I think he's good. That's what the process is. So we was like. A cybersecurity person is just knows the lingo. You can kind of feel it when mm-hmm. someone's talking to you, even if they're saying all the good words. Right. You, since you're in that field, you kind of can call BS, uh, where a recruiter couldn't call BS. So that that was the premise of it. Unfortunately, obviously, you know, startup stuff, um, um, it ended up um, imploding or, or we went our separate ways. But that really gave me the experience of not only building a V1 product because I was knee deep in the code, but also the whole development life cycle as far as, yeah. you know, what goes into crafting great software as far as, like, the marketing, what we need, product design, UX, how that all flows like, to create a great product. And obviously ma- managing, too, because that's my passion, too, managing, you know, especially managing an offshore development team who's not in a time zone, who had different cultural differences. So I learned a lot about that as yeah. well. And it was a beautiful experience. Like, I love my co-founders. We, we four brothers, four, four black brothers doing great stuff. So it was a good experience. And that, I, think, I think that's what actually helped me get my current job. <laughs> oh, not, not my current job. I had a job before that, my current job. But that was part of the reason why I got my job. So at one point, I was doing both. So I was doing SoCo part-time, and I had a full-time iOS development job at another company. Okay, that's cool. Now, as you were talking, I was like, man... I wonder if he know that I actually did an episode with a venture capitalist, a black venture capitalist mm. as well. Nice. So, uh, mm-hmm. actually, we got to do a part two because our video 
wasn't working that good in that remote <laughs> episode, but he's he a cool dude. Mm. But so what are you, so now all your roles have just been strictly software engineering? Software engineering, strictly iOS development in particular. So that's your niche? Yes. Can you develop for Android? No, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I could probably learn it. I've been, like, actually, in my day job now, I, I create tests um, for, in Kotlin, but I would not say I'm a Kotlin developer by any means. Hunter, what's that? <laughs> Kotlin is the language to develop for Android. Okay. Um, listen, <laughs> I, I don't know, and I'm, I'm trying to educate, like, you know, because it may be somebody out there that's watching and say, I want to be in software engineering, mm-hmm. and I don't know much about it. So it's you, and then I got another friend who uh, used to work at Amazon from mm-hmm. uh, do software engineering. Where he, I think he broke in. To Fang, like from a boot camp too, so nice. um, like four years ago. So he's oh, so he's been again for a while then. Okay, yeah. Well, he'll be on eventually. He's in Austin now. He moved. Well, he had to move to Seattle, and then he moved back down to Austin. Oh, we, nice. We're both from uh, Shreveport, so that's oh, what makes it pretty cool. We yeah, boys. Okay, yeah. But so I want to ask you this: If somebody wants to be a software engineer, what's you kind of give them like a, a high level roadmap, right? Mm. Because. My generic advice can still work for everybody, but I'm not a software engineer. And I know what I tell people that come for me, come to me that want to know about software engineering. Come like, well, I would do this, this, and this. I was like, see, in this part right here, go talk to a software engineer. Yeah. So, so what I would say, if you want to become a, a software engineer, I, I, I definitely think it's so broad. It's, it's so broad. First, I would say, f- f- figure out what n- you want to niche in, right? So I'm a, I'm on a, I'm a software engineer. That's a wide umbrella right um i think you have to dig down a little bit deeper on what you want to do do you want to do web do you want to do mobile and then or do you want to like back in right so that's like the three kind of like other sub umbrellas under the software engineering umbrella right i've always heard the term back in what is back in what's front end front end is what the user see and back end is what the user doesn't see but that has all the business okay so all the code and yeah. stuff is in the back end but the front end no, no the data the code's on the front end as well okay the, 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 the 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 back end like usually holds all the data. So when you sign up for something, your name, all that data, that's what the back end holds. Okay, so you're more so working with the databases and data. connecting all that stuff. Yeah, okay, that, like like that stuff. So so but once you figure out the the sub umbrellas you want to get into, then usually you have to say, do you want to do front end? Like if you're in web, you want to do front end. You want to do back end. If you're want to do mobile, you got to figure out do you want to do cross platform development? Like you do like something like a Flutter, which you can develop. In Flutter and then have it both um, have your app on both platforms at the same time or you want to go native do you want to develop specifically for mobile I mean Android or iOS so these are decisions that you have to make before you even dig down any deeper right so but once you you do that then you have to decide okay what are you comfortable with right because you gotta all of these things take learning a language right and everyone says like you learn one language and it'll be easier to kind of learn other languages which is very true it's very true I, my first language I learned was JavaScript, and I think that's what made it a little bit easier for me to learn Swift because I already had the, the basics down. I, I knew about variables. I know about objects. I know about inheritance. So those are kind of the bases that translate regardless. And you also got to figure out what do you want to do as far as, like, what do you want to build? A lot of people say they want to be engineers, but I always ask you, what do you want to build? And that usually will tell you what path to go down. Like, if you want to build a web app, then you want to be a web guy. Right, probably full stack. If you want to build mobile apps, then that's you want to. Now the decision is like, do you want to do iOS or Android? And then once you get into that, you got to really figure out. You got to have the language syntax. You got to learn the language. That's going to be the the first thing. So learn the language, and dive deep and like immerse yourself in that ecosystem. So for example, I'm an iOS developer, so I'm in tune with. You see, you got an Apple Watch on. Apple Watch, you know, I mean, I have to be in tune with what's going on with Apple. So, I, you know, I attend WWDC, which is Worldwide Developer Conference. He, he has the uh, Vision Pros in his trunk. I wish. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm broke. <laughs> I can't afford that. I, I, I wish. Um, I have interesting opinions on that as well. But I would just say, you know, obviously pick pick your, your niche you want to go into, learn the syntax, and then build. You have to build. And that's what we're going to get into a little bit later about how I feel about tech i really put a high emphasis on on builders and people who create in the space and i feel like that as a software engineer that's another thing that actually attracted me to software engineering because our work is very tangible so we get a lot of we get instant feedback because when you're a software engineer it's a, it's a verb almost you're doing something you're building you're creating so when you, someone says they're a software engineer and they're not building it's like almost like an oxymoron how 
how you a software engineer, but you're not building anything. So I, I would say, can you be one and then you're not building anything? No, I don't think so. And um, so a couple of questions too, because you said something that I thought about. Because I haven't taken a freaking database class and stuff in a while, but I think I kind of might have understood. And what you went by inheritance mm. is that like something inheriting properties or something that's out the code? Um, it's basically about um, not in the code. It's how should I say this? It's more about classes. Like so, you have objects, right? So yep. you have objects. So let's say, let, let me put it in terms of a dog, right? A dog is a generic thing, right? Right. There's plenty of dogs, right? But you can have a dog object, and every dog has four legs. Every dog usually barks, and they have fur. Those are the three objects in that. The, those are the three properties in the object, right? Now, when it comes to inheritance, you can have a different type of dog. So let's say we have a chihuahua, yeah. right? the Taco Bell dog, right? That Taco Bell dog or the chihuahua object will inherit from the dog object because we know a chihuahua has fur, has fur legs, and barks, a tail, right? two ears. Yep. So it's going to inherit from the, the generic dog object, but then at the same time, a chihuahua can have certain special properties that only apply to the chihuahua itself. Got it. So that's more about inheritance, right? Yeah. Now, that's a good analogy. That's kind of along the lines of what I was thinking, but I definitely want to be able to <laughs> <laughs> explain it. But I just knew, I was like, inheritance, it's, it's, t- it's getting something from somewhere, but I just yeah. got to figure out where it's coming from. So uh, this video will be sponsored by Level of Careers. It has a 14-day money-back guarantee. It's a week self-paced course. And for your reimbursement and counts for continuing education. Here are some of the reasons why you can choose cybersecurity, high demand, job security, competitive salary, work variety, and fulfilling work. The national average salary for information security analysts is of 113000 Your instructor is Josh Metacore, and here is the brief overview of the course. Theory introduction, security refresher, security frameworks, security regulations and standards, security operations signals. Then you have these great labs with Azure, Logging and Monitoring, Microsoft Signal, Secure Cloud Configuration, and they help you with job hunt and job hunt execution. Use my code to try out Level Careers. You'll get 10% off by using my code, and you'll be taking the next step in propelling your career to new height. Now back to our schedule programming. That's dope. Then you said, I believe you said full stack. I don't know if the audience knows what full stack is. Cause I, I think one of the, some of the, one of the boot camps out there is called full stack Academy or something. Yeah. Like that. I think there is like um, full stack is just basically doing the back end and the front end. Right. So the back end obviously is the data logic, usually the data in the business logic and, and storage. Whereas the front end is basically um, the user with the user sees. So basically like I said, UI, um, the UI logic, um, and basically, like the user interface, uh, how that looks, right? And, and being an iOS developer um, is heavy on front end because obviously you got to build the user interfaces, right? Mm-hmm. So it's heavy front end, and mainly what we do is we consume back end. So we get the data from a server, a server, or a cloud, and then we just when we get it, we just mutate it and, and we, we, we mutate it and transform it into a a form that the user would like to see, like the, the UI components. So when we make a call, you, you want to see like your your timeline, right? So the, the, the UI having your icon in a circle with a border around it and the text be bold and yeah. the subtext be gray, that's the kind of work we're doing when we're making a call for the, the service to kind of give right. us that raw data. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, I was like, you guys work a lot with the UI UX team? Yeah, yeah. I, in my day job, yeah, we do a lot. Okay. Um, so we, 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 we talk to them, especially when it comes to, um, any new feature that we're doing and it requires a new type of component. So that we have a, obviously designers who design everything, but then we also have a, a development team that specializes in creating those components as well. So. Got it. Might have to bring justice up here for a UI UX <laughs> software engineering type of uh, role. So, all right, man, real quick, high level. What's your, day in the life like of being an iOS engineer like do you are you able to go get your coffee and, and do walk the dog and stuff I I, I actually have a, a beautiful schedule actually because um uh, my, my company is based on, on Pacific right mm-hmm. so there I'm two hours ahead of them so, right and I have a son so I'm always up early right so I'm, I'm up at least seven o'clock this time CST while my team is like sleep. five o'clock sleep so usually my day in life is like get up, make him breakfast, change his diaper, get him dressed, and then take him to our babysitters, a.k.a. his grandparents. And then I'm back probably by 8.30. So 8.30, 6.30 at that time. So this probably still sleep. Then I make myself breakfast. 
And then I'm probably at the computer about 8.45, 9 o'clock. And then I don't, I sign on, but I don't say that I'm on Slack. So like my, my dot is still clear. From there, I would catch up on emails, which I'll just, I'll just see what happened, see what, what, see what my meetings are for today. And then I'll go on the Jira board, see what my tickets are, and I to start trucking, trucking on whatever ticket I have at the same time. But I like my schedule because it gives me that free time unbothered. <coughs> Excuse me. It gives me that free time unbothered to kind of do heads down work without anyone slacking me, pinging me, or emailing me. So I get like at least I'll say an hour, hour and a half of that kind of free time that mm-hmm. some of my coworkers don't get because when they get on, usually everyone else is on. Mm-hmm. So um, that's day in life. Like, then I'm coding uh, most of the time. It's I get a lot of heads down work time, but obviously there's meetings as well. There's there, there's obviously we have stand up. So you got the daily stand up, the, the scrum meetings. So we have a we the way we do it is we have stand ups not every day. Um, it should be know. honestly it should be really no more than two a week maybe to me in my opinion unless it's like something that's and very important that you gotta know about it every day yeah so we I, I, I guess we kind of have that kind of system because we have a zoom stand up right so we're a distributed team so we have the zoom stand up two times a week so we have it on Monday and Wednesday we have the you be on camera and you say your update and then we have any words. impediments? Any, any blockers <laughs> right if you, have, if you have blockers man I hate them words <laughs> that's how you, hey yeah. hey <laughs> so for the for the listeners and are watching you watching this right now, let us know you're in corporate without saying you're in corporate. <laughs> yeah, OKRs, KPIs, you know, you know the the, the corporate mm-hmm. thing go. Um, but um, so we have that, and then we have two Slack stand ups where you just write what you're what you're doing on the Slack. So that's on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Fridays. We don't have it. <coughs> so that's pretty much what we do, which is. You know, this is like ten minutes, if that ten fifteen minutes on the Zoom stand up, and obviously the Slack stand, you just write what you write. And then once we do that, then we might have some some meetings. Obviously, we do the scrum ceremony, so we do a retro at the end of our two week sprints. Um, do the stand up, we do, and then after that, it's just meetings. Depending on what product you're on, you might have you know you have might you have might have sync meetings with um, the PMs to kind of align on the feature in case there's any updates or anything like that. And then you might have you know the coworkers just want to sync up. Maybe they need some help. Um, we do all, obviously we have an automated testing suite that some, every, every sprint, someone is dedicated to doing the automated regression testing. So we have like stuff like that. Um, but that, I would say that's a day in the life, but so it's a combination of, you know, going to meetings, keeping, you know, the stakeholders, the PMs up to date with your progress, obviously via stand up and via those sync meetings with the PM, the product owners and stuff like that. But yeah, I would say. Okay. And then this is the last question directly about work. So what is like a, a ball pa- a ballpark range of like you know your your total comp? A ballpark range of my total comp right now. Um one let me see. One I'd say one seventy five. You think it's you think it's one seventy five is all in? All in, T C. Okay. Mm. And that's not bad going what only what year four? Year four, yeah. Year four, yeah, yeah. Four ish. Yeah. And is so like is your um, well, I don't know if it's like either you got, either you got stock or you got um bonuses. It's a combination of base, um, stock, um, RSUs and and bonus. Yeah. So technically, that can kind of change from year to year based on how well the stock performs and and the bonuses. Like bonuses sometimes can get paid out at different rates too. So depending on how good the company does. Yeah. So that that's definitely a factor as well. So yeah. All right, man. So the moment everybody's been waiting for. Listen, <laughs> let's let's get into some of the fun stuff he said. Let me go to my bookmarks, y'all. <laughs> I know y'all been waiting for it. Let's see where it is. Oh, man. Okay. So, on January 10th, 2024, Mr. Clyde Friedman III said, mm. the leaders of black tech Twitter are people who can't code. That's the problem with the space. When the majority of your leaders are tech adjacent and influencers, that's when you know you messed up in the game. <laughs> Ooh, that's spicy. And hold on, look, hey y'all, <laughs> we didn't even know each other at this time, but right under his comment, you see me saying, "Hey, come <laughs> elaborate this on the pod with me. You can get it off your chest there, because I think there are um, a lot of things people have assumed with this tweet." So, hey, that thing got like 10k looks. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it, it went viral and, and and it went viral and I didn't I didn't really expect it to either. I was just going about my day, you know, tweeting how I normally tweet. This wasn't like a special tweet to get engagement. This is what Clyde tweets 
I don't know what they base is. Somehow it got picked up and, and the algorithm just went off with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. So yeah. let's talk about it. What like about what it, made man. I guess like what prompted you, I guess, to to say that? Or what are you seeing on your timelines that's maybe others aren't seeing and they felt also a way about? Yeah, so you know, I and I've been seeing it for a while. So it wasn't like okay, that day I saw something that triggered me. Uh, it's something that I've been seeing for a while now, ever since I you know got in the space. And and when I say the space, I, I don't mean you know the, the 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 tech space. I really mean the um this this space around Twitter, this black technical space around Twitter. I noticed that a lot of people really are like selling courses they're they're really promoting lifestyle content and they're in tech right they're they're in tech and i realized that a lot of these people a lot of the major voices that i that i was seeing on my timeline your timeline may differ but a lot of them weren't technical right so i always say like i I found that the space was the most non-technical tech space i've seen in a while and I mean, me, me and a couple of friends, we, we, we discussed this, you know, this on the phone uh, behind the scenes. But then I saw a tweet and, you know, where everything was going on with <clears throat> with the layoffs and everything like that. And and there's this me seeing these people just talk about tech. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about because you're just an influencer. You don't really have that in the field experience. You're you're not building. And that's fine. Like I said before, I, you know, I managed a company. I was a CTO. I know how the different parts need to come together to craft software. So that's fine. But I just felt that there was a misbalance as far as the people giving the message and exactly what the message was, right? So the space is skewed. And, and I, I see it in my um, my personal life. A lot of time when I go to these mixers, I, I'm like the only engineer there, if, if I'm not the only one there, it's usually one or two of us, but everyone's like a recruiter, or everyone's like a, a PM or a business analyst. Like, engine, if you're an engineer, you're the minority in the room. So I kind of noticed this, and I'm like, why is this the case? You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of what spurred that tweet. So what spurred that tweet is really not to denigrate, you know, people who aren't engineers. That's I think that's what people kind of took from it. But what I think I really, really trying to call to, I want more people in the space that are technical. And I think that goes into a, a way deeper than that tweet. I think it comes to upbringing. I think it comes to making tech sexy again. I, I think that's really, really comes on making tech sexy again um, and making it more accessible. I think that's the main thing. So making it sexy and accessible, I think that would change the perception of people who want to get into tech. And, and, and another this antidote from my personal life, people all the time come to me and say, hey, Clyde, you know, they see, you know, I'm doing well, you know, I got the house, I got the, you know, they see the, they see the Tesla, oh, I want to get like you, bro. Uh, and, and I tell them what I do, they're like, oh, word. And then, no, no, I'm not lying. I said, tell them what they do. Then I'm like, oh, you're an engineer, man, that's that's cool, man, I wish I could do that, but, you know, that's too much for me. And then in my head, I'm like, why do you think that you can't do it? Like, I'm no tech savant, I'm, I'm no rock star code i think i'm pretty mediocre to be honest with you but um i think that if i can do it anyone can do it and i'm not just saying that like people who know me will tell you like uh no like if i can do it anyone can do it and i feel like people think that they come into the game saying like i don't want to do engineering so what they do is they say let me try to get into tech the most non-technical way i can that's what i noticed so they'll try to get in doing anything but technical stuff and i think that needs to change So it's like a lot to unpack there, right? I think, number one, what's happened over the last four years is people have been conflating the tech industry with, like, tech jobs because you could be in tech in a different industry because your job is, in fact, technical. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. I think it also depends as well as like I said I think what people consider to be non-technical is subjective because like my last episode with Terry I would consider Terry a very much so technical non-technical person like she probably is not the person doing the implementations Mm. but she's very skilled at what it takes to do infrastructure projects in a tech space because she did it so long she started rambling off different things I said I know she knows her job that's why Mm. she's a technical project manager so I think it's, it's different things. I think some people did get offended because maybe some people have just built their whole persona about, oh, I'm in tech type stuff. 
I do know, so, and I'm with you. So there are two things. There are people who've been in for a while who they probably are doing their lifestyle thing. However, they have a track record of before that blew up of showing, hey, I did this for X amount of years. Mm-hmm. This is what I started as. There are those. Then are the, the people that just came and they are, they've just been deemed a leader because they got popular fast and they show the stuff that they have, which is not a hating thing. Like I, I don't like care about what nobody got going on. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to always do what I do no matter what. But I think, like, when you say technical, you know, it, it are different things, right? Because, like, if outside of, you know, a software engineer, you got security engineers who they do their um, technical part on there. Like, I'm not a, a engineer right now. Um, they have something, like, in, in a blue team called detection engineering where you can pretty much work on detections. And that's something I'm going towards just because it's just a better, another skill set to add to the utility belt. But even in my roles, there are certain things you have to be very skilled at to understand what the problem, like, especially if you're dealing with something like incident response. Like, so I think is, I think a lot of people just felt the way about, Oh, you're not building nothing. You ain't Bob the builder. So you're not in tech. So you don't, I think, I think I don't say some people might've been insecure about it, but I think some people took a slight at, you saying they're not building and the game is messed up and feeling like, you know, hey, no, my contributions matter. Because, like, at the end of the day, people want to feel like they are providing value. They're doing something. So even the non-technical program managers and all those other people, they want to feel like, hey, now who are you to tell me that what I'm doing is not important? Who are you to tell the left guard on the football team mm-hmm. that I didn't help Pat Mahomes stay up right to throw the touchdown? Yeah. So, understandable and, 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 and totally understandable. And that's why I'm here to clear it out, right? So when I say technical, you know, that's a, that's a, I, that software engineering isn't the end all be all for what's technical. Okay. I, I just want to get that in the air right now. Um, what I meant by technical is like I consider anyone that has to have a specific technical knowledge on something technical, right? So that's the, the, the cloud engineers, that's the cybersecurity. That's, I even include UX designers in that. Yeah. I always say that if I was an engineer, I'd be a UX designer. The UI UX designer, um, and it goes. There's, there's other ones off the top of my head. I can't quite really, really think about right now. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think some people took offense because they took the tweet as, "Okay, you don't code, you don't build, you ain't shit," you know, basically. And that is not what I'm coming at. I'm coming at balance, right? So everything I say is balance, right? Yeah. I just said it's skewed. That's for like most of the people who have the biggest voices in the space aren't technical. And, and when I say aren't technical, I mean the ones who <clears throat> have never been technical, not like people who did, like, well, let's say right now, let's say if I stopped coding right now and became a PM or something like that. I'm not talking about people like that. I'm talking about people who've never done anything coding at all, don't want to necessarily, and don't have a, don't have a passion for it. So when they, so their perspective is valid, don't get me wrong, but their perspective, their perspective is kind of skewed because they had never been in the field. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, to, to bring up an analogy, I, w- I would say it's like being on the football team, like you mentioned before, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things that go to being a great football team. You have the players, the coaching staff. You know, then beyond the coaching staff, you have ownership. You have the franchise people managing the franchise. You have the people on the sideline. You have the water boys, right? They can all say they're part of that football team. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. But – you also have to acknowledge acknowledge the differences in the role players on that football team. That's all I was saying. Like you wouldn't say that you know the football player if you had a, a, discor- a discourse about football, and then most of the people who are talking about football are like coaches and the the the, the coaching staff and the people who manage the players. And there's like one football player. That you're like, okay. Can we get some balance here? Because he's actually in the field. He kind of his perspective is kind of important because he's actually doing the work. Yeah, but I think it's different though because we just saw the game just come down to coaching. The yeah. coaches are supposed to set you up to put you in good positions to succeed. So like your some of your non technical parts that have to direct influence on whether resources or different things you need to make your apps or build stuff. They are set up to help you succeed. So it's just one of those things like everything kind of like that circle of life. Like it has to. <laughs> How everything moves will depend on how functional the other things go. I, now, sometimes, I think we've seen a bad coaching where, hey, if the, if the person on the field is saying, hey, I see this. Why you keep on trying to tell me this? And they run a cover two, and they are, they are literally blanketing this guy over here. Stop trying to tell me to do this route. If I check 
end to this post is going to be wide open. Stop telling me that. I know what I'm seeing. Mm. So we got that option too. So I get what you're saying too. I think it just goes on, on, on both hands of. But my thing is different too because this is I bring it down to this. Could you have football? Could you still play football without the coaches? Yes. Could you play football without the players? No. That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. I think I think that's a good one, but I guess in regards to what you mean, like play football without the the coaches. If if you play the Super Bowl right now, right, mm-hmm. and the coaches drop dead, mm-hmm. would the game still go on? Yes. The reverse. It wouldn't go down. But who gave the who gave the players the plays? The coach gives the player the plays, but the quarterback can do it too. LeBron does it. The, the LeBron's a player. Coach. Yeah, but who? <laughs> but I see if that's if, if we're gonna go on that straw man argument, then we gotta say who's the person that started all the plays just from the jump, from the root of everything. So it's like the how do, can do that though? No, but I'm saying how do they know? Like because that's the thing too. Sometimes them players aren't making good decisions because. Sometimes the coaches aren't. Let's just, right? bro, all right, bet. You said you want to go that route. Well, let's talk about people playing football in the hood. Automatic, too. Everybody running nines. Like, that's what it's going to turn into. I disagree with that because I think, like, at, the, at this point, I think that the breakdown, like, for example, like, in my company, right, we don't have certain roles anymore because we realize that the engineer can do those roles. For example, we, we were talking, la- we we talking about that last part. We have no scrum master. We were talking about that because, last part. Because we can do that. We don't have any dedicated QA because we do the QA ourselves, right? And 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 I think what people are fearful is that companies are getting leaner now and that they're realizing that, hey, some of these jobs are kind of fluff where engineer can just do those jobs. Yes, it's a little, you know, more time on their plate, but the engineer can do these jobs as well. So that's what I, I think is, is the case, like especially with someone like me. I could do the UX too. I could do UX design too. I could do the Scrum. I can do all those jobs. I'm, I'm just an engineer, and I feel like that's what we're seeing with the layoffs. They're they're becoming lean, and then when companies come lean, what's the first to get chopped off? Exactly. So that's what I'm saying, and I'm not de- de- degrading that. I'm just saying that's what it is. I and this gets into the the concept of flat techness. I don't think anything should be flat techness. Yes, you're in tech. I'm not discriminating that you're in tech yes but it's a difference between being a technical worker and working in tech anywhere i go anywhere you go you're still gonna be a tech worker you can work for a farming company you can work for a ballet yeah. production you're still gonna be a technical worker because the nature of your job is ingrained in it if i'm a salesperson if i work for farming i'm in farming i do sales for farming i'm not a technical worker if you do sales for google because what i've noticed is that because of this this idea of flat techness that the janitor now works at the Google building can say he works in tech now. People at Best Buy are telling us, are telling you because they sell the TV they work in tech. And I think that they have a better case to say they work in tech than the janitor does. But I feel like that's the, the point that we're coming to right now. And and I feel like that it kind of erases the unique stru- the, the unique journey and struggles that people who are more technical have to go through. Right? There's a reason why the salaries are different for people who are more technical because there's a higher there's a higher learning curve. And I feel like flat techness erases that. Oh, you're just the same as me. Like did you you, you didn't have to learn these data structures. You didn't have to learn these algorithms. You didn't have to learn you set up a, a server or a database. It's different. It's, there's levels to it. Like that's that's all I'm saying. There's levels. You know what's funny? I'm going through some of your quotes of this. That's why I've been looking at other people like knowing I'm doing I've been looking down it's like how is this gatekeeping? Do people actually know what gatekeeping means? Because gatekeeping means you're trying to prevent people from doing something. Yeah. People use words so wrongly. Like, he's not gatekeeping at all. He's not withholding information from you. He's not purposely not letting you get into the field like they were doing some of us years ago when we first were trying to get in. Mm-hmm. So that's not what he's doing. But I've, I've, really been just, I've really been trying to find the quote where – you and that person went back back and forth and like I guess why that they felt they want to get you fired. So that's what I'm really trying to find. Yeah, so just to get some 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 background on that. So throughout this whole, you know, Twitter fiasco or X fiasco, some someone tried to get me fired from a job. And this is a person that purports to be for black tech and, and for the unity of black tech, but yet they try to get a black a black man fired from his job so that he couldn't feed his family anymore off of tweets that Maybe a, a disagreement um, among our ideas, but definitely nothing that deep for you to, one, look me up, two, 
find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm assuming she found me on LinkedIn. Find my job. Find out the number to even report me on a job. I don't know how to even find that number. So you're doing some research to find this number and to report me. And the only thing I can think about is, like, obviously she's, um, this person's a coward. She's a coward because <laughs> she blocked me. <laughs> One, we, did, we weren't following each other from the beginning. But when I found out, I was like, oh, I'm blocked too. So you're going to do some coward move, report me, and then hide, trying to hide behind be- blocking me? It, it, was, it was pure cowardice. And and really just shows how, you know, people really aren't what they purport to be. <coughs> Excuse me. And I really, like, that's my, my first, like, really – experience of someone that took it to heart like that yeah yeah i had the discourse because they could have the thing yeah. is she could have just blocked you from the jump blocked you from the jump and kept it kept it funky but the thing is this person lives I, like I, this person has no life they might got a crush on you either that or they got no life i think they, i think this person has no life what if that's not even the person what if that's like a fake page and they're saying they the what if they're impersonating the person they say they are it could, it could be it could be but i i think it's a real person they, they have no life clearly they got no man because had enough time to do that. Clearly, you ain't getting what you need. <clears throat> so, I'm looking at like some of your old tweets, like kind of like the journey he was talking about. So, I have him bookmarked like in 10, 11, 12. He was saying breaking into tech right now, super hard. The climb is just getting harsher and harsher. Then he was talking about uh, mm-hmm. you just uh, release your first app to the app store, mm-hmm. put a lot, put in a lot of work, finally obtain the title of senior iOS engineer. Oh, yeah, some previous company, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you were talking about you had an interview. For the iOS engineer job Am I ready for this role Who knows But I ain't gonna tell myself No mm. That's their job If I'm just trying to climb But this is another funny one That people got Well it was I thought it was this one But uh You say We're there at the point Where anybody can sell you A pair of AA batteries And claim they work in tech <laughs> Yeah That goes back to my Flat tech list. I feel like You know Like no one And I, and Mina Another person on, on X Was going back and forth With this as well Is that no one else Has the same issue No one plays these games In medicine Right, no one plays these games in laws. Everyone knows the difference between medical professionals who are like a nurse, a nurse practitioner, doctors versus the people who work at the front desk or people who like. There's a, there's a <laughs> oh, difference. so I think you're saying I, I get what you're saying though. I I do understand. It's like somebody be like, "Yo, I'm in medicine, but all you do is give me my uh, what's the thing called when you go to work in case you need it or you went to school." Was it everything? No, if you went to school, you had to have this uh, thing to get to the office so they can like say, "Hey, your absence is excused." The, the note for the pass. I know you're talking. Yeah, about, I don't know what officially called. Like you set my appointments up and you give me um, the doctor's notes, doctor's excuses, mm-hmm. and you talking about you in you in medicine. No, you're not. <laughs> exactly, and like you're in administrative work. Maybe that's like to a lesser extent, but that's kind of like the the same vein um, that I, that that I think this situation is. And I, like you said before, I think that people. People want to feel like they're contributing, which I, which they are. That they're, they're contributing. I'm going to recommend that they're contributing, but there's still a difference, right? There's, there's we, we can acknowledge the differences between the roles in tech and not degrading your life. There's, there's a difference, right? No one says, "Oh, the doctor is the same as the the, the the doctor who's doing your surgery is the same as the person at the front desk." We know they're different, right? And that's okay. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Yeah, but I think now they just purposely. Do not want to take what you say, like any mirror. It's like oh, he a troll, and I was like, I see y'all can't tell this man trolling. Y'all know he being funny, but uh, he's talking about the double A batteries. But yeah, I can find obvious. all the. I can. That was obvious. Like, well, I can know. find like all the other stuff because like it blew up. Like I seen. Uh, I just looked at AP's part. She was just. Uh, I think y'all actually had a little decent discourse about it, and so at least some people was like y'all actually had conversations about it. Everybody else was really. To say, ah, oh, man, put your head back down, no social awareness. But it's just like, I know he's like, bro, I make posts all the time. Where y'all came from? I, I, exactly. And I think that also, it, it was weird, too, because it was like, almost like a. And you know, they were talking you they were talking about that tweet like the whole week. Bro, they were talking about that tweet for like, like a couple weeks. Like I'll say two weeks they were talking about that because my boys was like, they're still talking about it. Because I said, I said, I said the word tech adjacent, right? So the word tech adjacent. At first, the way they were acting, I thought I made the word up. I was about to make some shirts and put this on some shirts and sell it. Then I went online. I'm like, this is this. I didn't make, I didn't invent this word. This word. Maybe you should change your display name and not tech adjacent. I, I maybe I should because the, the tech, tech adjacent has been a word and it's not a derogatory term. It's a term that relates to what we described earlier in the show, like people who are in tech but maybe not necessarily technical workers, right? People who are close to the technical workers and that support the technical workers, right? So it's not an offensive term. So I'm like, 
why are people acting like that's the boogeyman word, right? And why are people so hard up and trying to discredit me? They was going through like, oh, he's only been doing this for four years. You know, he's, he's just, he, he, he was unemployed for six months, even though I was working with Soko for those six months. But trying anything, saying that my tweets were misogynistic, that came out of the blue. I haven't I've, I've gotten I've gotten that before. <laughs> yeah, like I, I haven't got it. I'm just like, where's the? And then the, the people that coming at me, I'm like, please point me to the misogynistic tweet. Crickets, because like, they couldn't find it. I'm like, point me to these. Tweets. Some people couldn't even tell you what misogynistic means. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, and then it, it, it was so crazy that I was like, okay, I'm just waiting for someone to say this is racist. I'm like, it was going it was going to be misogynistic. Then some out the blue is going to be like, yeah, this is a racist tweet. And I'm like. Hmm. I'm surprised. I didn't get that, but I was surprised. I, that was next in the line, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at some of you. Like, this is funny. I'd be laughing at somebody's like, yes, I got some content to talk about. Because there's always some, like, some interesting, funny stuff, like, in here. That's what it, I think that's what it really came down to. I think they, I think the, the space needed a villain of the week. And I just happened to match it. I was, I was just happened to be at the right place at the wrong time. And it was like, let me, let's hop on this for a content engagement. Because people were tweeting about it, didn't at me, at least at me. I want some engagement, too. Um, but they would do that a, a, a lot of the time. And I, what, what I noticed is that I'm like, people just were harping on it day and day and night because a lot of the people, that's what they do. They, they profit off the drama. Like, I'm like, y'all guys are still talking about this. Like I'm trying to talk about some anime, what happened latest in Dragon Ball Super. <laughs> and people are still at me talking about <laughs> tech adjacent. Yeah. And then luckily one of my boys, um, I, I haven't met the dude in person. I think his, I think, I think his at name is like Omega or something, right? But he was really a, a soldier for me. <laughs> Shout out to that brother because he was really helping me and like going back. Cause like I was getting sworn, man. Like the minions, I call, I call them minions. The minions were coming for my neck, and I'm like, I'd be who are the minions? The minions are the people who I think I think I think in the Black Tech Twitter space, I think there's like a there's a hierarchy. At least what I've seen. Black Tech Twitter, there's a hierarchy, right? And there's a certain fo- a bunch of followers that people kind of like are lackeys to, right? I call those people the minions. And the minions can be women, it can be dudes. It's, it's not a gender thing. Um, it's just that they adhere to that group think. And then anyone who goes against that group think is enemy and they just swarm. So that's what I, I was the enemy. So they swarmed on me. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what it was. And he you know was me. Backing me down. When stuff <laughs> like that happens, I, I, I'm like, if that happens to me the day I get swarmed, I'm going to post when Bane told Batman, you adopted the dark. I was born in it. Exactly. And I, and I, and I, and I think a lot of the times, too, I'm like, I, I, it, was like it was almost like a kind of like a feeling that they wanted me to, to bow down. Like, I had to bow down to the hierarchy. Like, yo, she said something wrong. Do you know who you're talking to? Like, even when I responded to somebody, they was like, do you know, who, one person, like, do you know who you're talking to? I'm like, are they royalty? I, I'm th- I'm th- I think I know who that person was. I think y'all's conversation did go a little sideways. Cause I don't think, I don't think they had the understanding of what you were saying at first, and they was like, "Dang, he disrespecting so and so and all this other stuff." Like, like, like I, I don't but know. I would say too, you might have just been replying real fast and not knowing who people was. To be honest, but the thing is, I didn't see the shit. I said, "Who is this royalty?" I don't I, personally. I well, no, care. not that. I don't remember. I know. In this specific instance, who they may be talking about, I just can't find. I don't know their exact name to go back and see like what y'all was talking mm-hmm. about. Because I've did it before. I, somebody actually probably been saying something good, and I responded fast and not wasn't paying attention to what they said, and they didn't really say something that was ill intentioned. Yeah. So that happens a lot on social media. But the thing with me, when I'm on social media, I don't. There's, there's no hierarchy. I don't care who you are. Like we can, we 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 talk as equals. Like there's no like, oh, this person, this person. Like, I'm gonna like. I'm gonna yeah, I don't think I don't think they I, I don't think that. they meant like hierarchy. I meant. I think they probably meant like, hey, do you know what this person does? Like what they what they accomplished. Not in the hierarchy part. It's like, let's say you was trying to talk basketball and you didn't know the person you was really talking to was Kobe, well, Michael Jordan, LeBron, anybody, right? Mm-hmm. So you just was talking about basketball. I'm like, yo, that's LBJ right there. Maybe, maybe, maybe I, I, I didn't take it that way, but like you said, maybe I was talking talking fast, but I still felt that 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 aura of like, do you know you talking like you you need to bow down, peasant. This is a person. <laughs> like, no, bow I'm, down, I'm, 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 I don't bow care about down. that because the other thing too, I, I live in a real life. I live in real life too. Like a lot, a lot of people live live life on Twitter. I'm like, if I see you in person, you wouldn't have that energy. We 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 know you wouldn't have this energy. Like I know so, so many people that I know who tweet that are like back at home, and I see them tweet. I'm like, you you're not like that. At, at all, <laughs> so you're not it, that guy, pal. It, it's funny. I'm like, okay, but like you exist in on Twitter. Outside of Twitter, you are non-existent. Okay, so that's what I felt. Like. Yeah, 
And like, and to piggyback off his conversation, him and I were talking about this. <coughs> we were talking about how getting into tech now is pretty much akin to an MLM. <laughs> they just change the vehicle. They try to find the easiest way. Well, there are two different things. Like you say, non-technical roles like like a tech sales or something like that are easier to get into because it just is. It doesn't require you to have a lot of tech technical acumen and you can gain some of the skills you need quicker than the technical mm-hmm. stuff. Agreed. But when it comes to my realm, first of all, the red flag is like if you're telling somebody can get in a cyber, when it's so broad, it's hard to just say somebody can get in a cyber. But like, I'm going to show you this. Anytime you may see a, a poster or a photo of somebody that got a Got a suit on that's probably not tailored, but telling you you can get in cybersecurity real <laughs> not fast. Tailored. That's a, that's a red flag right there. It's baggy. If they're saying how to, if you can land a job in cybersecurity in forty five days with a six figure salary being remote, tell them to drop dead. And I'm not gonna say what I want to say, <laughs> but I just show him the picture. <laughs> but like, this is a harder economy because people who don't have. A, a lot of experience, a lot of you do not get the chances to work remote. So nobody can promise you you're finna find a remote job. It's got way harder. They, a lot of people are back in office. Some of you guys who are just starting off actually need to be in office because you're not going to do that well being remote and you need to go learn to where now you can go somewhere <laughs> else and, and prove yourself. But no, it's the MLM game. They'll, if you're typical, if you think about your typical MLM person, they will come up and talk to you. They'll sell you a story. If you go to the meetups, somebody's sad and now they're this high earner or if they're doing stuff on social media, they're relaxing, they're in a private jet, they're <laughs> working by the pool. like they, that yacht too. So this is some of the stuff they go into. Now, that's not saying that you can't get some of these things. You just can't get them quickly. A lot of people don't say, hey, it took me years to do this and I had to start my own company to do this and do speaking engagements and this and that. A lot of people, there's only a certain amount of people to say, hey, I get money these other ways that affords me this lifestyle versus the people that don't. And that's because, hey, they are trying to sell you something. And you got to be honest with yourself, too, is like looking at it compared to what it's asking for. Is it going to be doable? Find the people who went through the program and see if they got real names. That's a big one. Because this recent guy is another per not this dude, but there's another dude on one of the bigger platforms who's talking about he can get people in cybersecurity in 45 days. I went to his website. I was like, these people... Whoever he paid to do these testimonials on lying, they <laughs> they don't have last names. You can just tell they're not in cybersecurity, like they're reading the script. You look at what they're what he's offering. I said it just does not add up. It's just too hard to go from knowing nothing. I don't care if you even get into one of the more non technical spaces of governance, risk, and compliance. It's still stuff you got to know. Yeah, you have to ask yourself without some intense projects and having to get the gab and just knowing somebody. What is going to make somebody want to hire you just because you spent 45 days doing something? And, and and I think that speaks to something else in the space as well that I kind of touched on some of my tweets as well. Um, I think a lot of people need to do the due diligence. I think a lot of people are just swept up by an attractive person mm-hmm. who says, you know, who has a gift of gab possibly, who can talk a talk, and says a couple of technical words here and there. I think they get swept up by that, and they don't want to do their due diligence. Yeah. A lot of these scams – could be debunked if you just go do a simple Google search. Just do a ten minutes of research, yeah. and some of them won't even scam. Some of them just really would would be more so suited for you if you had some type of experience first, because mm. it's a different. Like that's the reason why, like getting a, being a software engineer or going to cloud and computing or something else that's a little bit more engineering based is not easier to do, but the path is a little bit more linear because you know on most of the jobs because you're gonna know have to know this stuff. Yep. When they have different jobs, it's not like that. It's a little harder. And it's also harder to for certain things to get experience doing. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a huge one. That's a huge one. Um, for, like for, for example, like a lot of like the cloud stuff, like you have certificates, programs. Like People will tell you the certificate programs aren't the be-all, end-all, but I think they give you at least a baseline. Like It's like going to math class, right? If you take a certificate... That way they know you at least know what 2 plus 2 equals 4 is. You might not know that some of the more intricate ways to get to that, but at least you know that. That's a baseline. And I feel like that's what the search give you. A lot of these other ones is the space of, like, faith. It's based off faith. Like, he says it. He talks the talk. We'll, take, we'll, we'll gamble yeah. with him. You know what I'm saying? And it's kind of different for, like, the more technical roles. Because you have to have, like, 
you have to either show your work or you have to do a technical assessment. And anyone who's been through those technical assessments can tell you that those are no jokes. Well, now certain companies do this. Like, um, uh, some one of my clients a job to come in at CrowdStrike, and I told him, "Hey, you're gonna have to do the CTF before then." Mm-hmm. And, and I was what's like, the CTF? Oh, it's capture the flag. Oh, okay. so it's just a set of questions and exercises you're doing because that's it. This is a way to test your acumen of being on a blue team. And uh, he did okay. He came up short a little bit, and I was like, "Yo, we should have reached out sooner." Because like one of the things you gotta do at work is like, "Hey, if you did some after like two three minutes, you don't know, just ask somebody." It's okay if you don't know. But I was like, you kind of wasted a lot of time on your own when I could have helped you and we maybe could at least got you an interview. You still got to nail the interview, but that's the thing too, like where some people are doing like those technical assessments or, or giving you some real world scenarios. And and now, so back when, years ago, when I was telling people, hey, you can't, so lie on your resume you want to, you're going to find out in that interview. Mm-hmm. They going back to asking more scenarios. People have been burned these last three, four years because people don't want to be honest. I'm telling you, a person to take an honest person who don't know everything over you just making up something wanting to lie. A lot of people don't get that because some of these programs are telling them, "Hey, go lie on this and say you know this and that." And now they are <laughs> on LinkedIn saying, "Hey, I I can't find work. It's been four or five months. I can't find work. What I'm doing? I did what they told me to do. It's not working." Yeah. So yes. those are those things. I asked this person about this one prominent program, and she almost like. Cuss me out And I'm like yeah. I was actually trying to Help you And try to see what your resume Look like or something yeah. Why you're not getting interviews But You blocked your blessings I mean I, I guess they made you Sign an NDA But you ain't got to Take it out on me It wasn't my fault You didn't have a job I ain't tell you to sign up And pay that $15,000 yeah. Which is not the price But the thing is Like I said You just got to be Logical with yourself mm-hmm. if 90 days I don't think 90 days Should really necessary. On rare occasions And I tell people this all the time, You got to have An elite skill set Or no people I've I've had people in my network that they I seen with Pat. They don't say you know what they're gonna be good. One like one of my friends who's he's he's killing the game now. He's like what twenty one maybe yeah twenty one probably twenty two this year. Oh, a young guy. Yeah, yeah, and he's he's out of fame right now, and this is a mm. over span since twenty twenty. Oh, well, he's doing his thing. Okay, he's getting the bag. <laughs> yeah, but he knows his stuff though. Yeah, yeah. And I saw that in him. He was one of the few that wanted to put in work. I said, hey, this first the first full time blue team job he had was underpaying him for a sock. I said, hey. Take it, get the experience. I got you. I was letting them know, yo, I got a spot open up on my team. We're gonna refer you. You be straight. Went there. He doubled his salary. Left there. Got some more salary. And now he's at at a fame company. But it don't always happen like that because a lot of people are not willing to do what he did. Like you said, hey, I was down. I quit my job. I did the apprenticeship. I did this for a year. I got laid off. I moved down here. I did this free for six months. A lot of people are not willing to do that. No. Um, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mix of people being comfortable in their current situation. And and when I say comfortable, you don't – I mean comfortable. I don't mean like, oh, you're living life. You don't live much. You're just complacent. You're complacent. Yeah, more complacent, yeah. And people don't want to take that. And people, like I said, like I think it's a root cause. We have to tell people, like, your journey is not going to be linear. Most people's journey is not linear. It's 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 a, Mine it's, it's a mix of linear. valleys and, and hills, right? It goes ups and down, ups and down. Sometimes you take two steps, but then you may take two steps back, but then you may take five steps forward. And you just got to have that faith in yourself because if, if I if I was like, you know, I came to my breaking point when I was unemployed. My unemployment was running out. I had no job. I only technically worked in tech on paper for a year because before that I was doing freelance work. They really don't care about that as much as they care you working for a reputable company. So when I was like, I was actually applying for finance jobs. I actually applied for finance. I knew I applied for Lime, and I had a, a case study interview, and I applied for the Japanese company. And I was like, it hurt me because I'm like, yo, I did all that work to get in tech, and now I got to go back to finance. And the thing is, I'm glad I didn't get the jobs, those jobs, because I felt if I got those jobs, I would have fell back into my complacency. Mm-hmm. And I probably wouldn't be in tech right now if I had those jobs. There's a saying I had on one of my videos. It's a video I had when I was laid off. But it was titled, well, I made it after I laid off years later. It was like 100 jobs told me no. And actually more jobs than that told me no. I just had only 100 on that Excel spreadsheet that I showed mm-hmm. in the video. I said, mm-hmm. sometimes the job you want at the job you need. Mm-hmm. And then I had cut to a part of uh, Devon Dudley saying, oh, my brother, <laughs> testify. <laughs> but yep. a lot of people needed to hear that. Because yeah. even in regular jobs, man, you really want the job and something don't happen. I, got, I have some stuff I'm going to talk about months on down the line about similar situations that I don't want to talk about right now. Mm-hmm. But it's happened to me before. It just really means it wasn't a job for you. So without my job searches, my clients or whoever else, I always tell people, hey, this is a process. Some is short, some is fast. 
got to keep going and try to keep on getting better. And that's the key too, trying to get better every day at what you've been doing. And don't stop. A lot, I'm going to give you all some free game too, but I see like, uh, I'm going to just say a person like yourself who's trying to pivot. Let's say, for instance, I, I'm pretty sure you still like get better at your coding when you can or whatever. Mm-hmm. Some people will do stuff in cybersecurity where they just learn the skill and this and that, but then they stop. So if they, they stop, so now when it comes to the interview, they can't explain the stuff because you stopped doing it. I say you got to do whether it's 30 minutes a day or hour, keep on doing it every day. And and this this goes back to the the passion versus I'm just doing it for a paycheck conversation. I I just had legit earlier today when my group tried back at home. I'm like, I tell people all the time, like I have a, a personal project, and the personal project does two things for me. Like obviously, eventually, if it does blow up, I'm I'm gonna go with it. But it also keeps me fresh. It keeps me updated to the latest thing. Right. So right mm-hmm. now, I'm integrating it's a it's called Her Travel App. And basically, it's a social group itinerary planning app for trips. So I work on that on the side, and I'm, I'm working with the latest technologies because I work for a legacy, a legacy company, so I'm not as working on the bleeding edge of technology anymore. So this keeps me fresh. I'm adding Gemini. I'm adding AI to it, and it just keeps me fresh so that when people are talking about some of the things that I may not work on on a daily basis, I can still contribute. I can still talk. I can still sound knowledgeable about what they're talking about latest in the industry because I'm actually building it. And I told my cousin – and my little boy about this today because he's a UX designer. He's actually doing it too. Like he's working on some some side projects and building websites or designing some websites for his friends. And I say that all the time. It doesn't have to be like people when, people, when we say that, people think, oh, I don't have time for that. I got a kid. He has a kid. He has a, we have girlfriends, wives. You don't have to do it all day. Hour, boom. You, you can do it for an hour. 30, no even 30 excuse. Minutes, even 30 minutes. You know. Just to keep you fresh. Like we're not saying be a recluse or be like, you know, the stereotypical idea of what a software engineer is being a, a neck beard basement dweller. No, we're not saying that, but I think, you know, 30 minutes every other day, a couple of hours a week goes a long way into one, you becoming an SME, a subject matter expert. And it's going to pay dividends for you down the line because a lot of the jobs I've have past the technical interview have been just conversational. Just talking about the space, talking about the technology you use. What, what's the latest thing you did? Um, what's how you feel about you know what's going on in the iOS development world right now? And if you don't have that relevant knowledge to have to be you know to talk about it, they can kind of tell that you're not into it. It's like you being in sports, right? But you don't know what's going on with the Super Bowl. Like clearly, you're not really into sports like that. If you don't know the Patrick Mahomes, Travis, like you, like you're in this space. That's why I always say immersion matters because a lot of these conversations. Because when everyone's technical, what is, is what it's going to fall back on is um, I think it's going to fall back on your soft skills. Your ability to connect and your ability to to sell yourself, and having that immersion in your industry and in your craft allows you to speak knowledgeable, knowledgeably about what you're trying to get the job for. But it also makes you come off as more of an expert than someone else who just can't really sell themselves as much, but knows the technical, but they can't sell themselves as much. Dope, man. So, where can our listeners? Where can they? Well, if they want to follow you, I'm gonna tell you how to, you know, proceed with caution. <laughs> but where can they follow you at? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't bite. Um, but um, you can follow me on X or, or formerly known as Twitter. Um, handle name is C3 Freeman. Um, you can follow me on Instagram if you want to as well. Um, handle is Turbo Trizzy. <laughs> That's my villain name. Yeah, mm-hmm. man. But uh, I appreciate y'all. We might have to do like a part two so I can really let him like unleash. I feel like he's start, was trying to hold back and be PC. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate y'all for, for tuning into the episode. Like I always say, man, subscribe to the Patreon. Um, Buy the ebook. If you need to help get into cybersecurity, I'll book a call. But until next time, like I always say, let's stay textual and we out. Peace. Peace.